the use of drugs and other non-food substances to alter the physiology or the psychology of an individual is becoming increasingly prevalent and especially uh, among college-age students. So this lecture is going to deal with use of substances and their misuse and abuse. And to begin this conversation, we need to take a look at addiction and addictive behavior. So addiction and addictive behavior. Uh, these are defined as out of control habits. And these out of control habits or addiction and addictive behavior will result in negative impact on both your physical and psychological health. Some of the general characteristics for addiction or addictive behavior are going to include things like reinforcement of that behavior, most frequently uh, personal reinforcement or justification of that behavior, a uh, sense in the individual saying the behavior is okay. Furthermore, um, addictive behavior is going to be compulsive and craving. It will exhibit loss of control, so engaging in a behavior without a sense of control. Uh, you'll see the behavior escalate, become more prevalent or more profound, and then an individual may actually begin to receive negative consequences. So each of these are going to be characteristics that may indicate that some behavior has become an addictive behavior or has led to addiction. And there, there is a well-defined physiological response that occurs as an individual goes through the process of forming an addiction. And so these things can be, um, can be recognized. And typically, the, the behaviors are very common behaviors that lead towards overuse or misuse and eventually to addiction. So it's not rare conditions or rare behaviors, it's common behaviors. Uh, behaviors that are acceptable to society. Now really there is no single pinpoint or cause that we can identify that leads without question to an addiction or an addictive behavior, but there are several uh, uh, different things that may lead towards a behavior becoming an addiction or an addictive behavior. Uh, it may result from uh, coping. You have some sort of traumatic event and you use the behavior to cope, so you use it as a, as a coping device. Or it might be an environmental factor that drives a behavior to become an addiction. The substances or behaviors themselves may be addictive. So for example, the nicotine in cigarette smoke has aspects that make that particular substance an addictive substance. So some of these common behaviors that can lead to addiction, uh, the most common that we see in U.S. society today are things like gambling that's become compulsive. Or 
shopping that's become compulsive. It might be internet use that's become addictive. So very common behaviors, gambling or shopping, the use of the internet, that have become compulsive or they've become addictive. Uh, again, there are some behaviors that are a little bit less um, societal norm or they're at least hidden from society a little bit more frequently. Things like pornography. Alcohol abuse or smoking. So all of these can become addictions and have attributes that make them prone to become addictive. Extending from smoking and alcohol, um, there are other substances that are addictive. And I just want to real quickly outline some of the common addictive substances that we find in college-aged adults. And the figure you're seeing over here are some of those uh, addictive behaviors that are considered non-medical drugs that are used, includes things like alcohol, cigarettes, cigars, and uh, other things. And you can see the percentage of college students that have used these things in the last 30 days compared to all of the um, population here in the United States. And you can see that almost all of these things are higher within the college age population than compared to the overall population. So let's take a look at some of these in a little more detail. We're going to start out with drugs. Drugs can be very addictive substances. And a drug is a chemical other than food that is intended to affect the structure and the function of the body. So intended to affect the structure and function of the body. Uh, there's many different types of drugs. Drugs are also going to include, or this category of drug, drugs includes the psychoactive drugs. So these would be chemicals that are going to alter the state of the mind. So they will alter consciousness. Consciousness, or the experience of the individual, uh, such as hallucinations. And many of these psychoactive drugs are actually going to be used in medical terms for individuals to deal with psychological issues. But individuals who don't need them for medical purposes will use them to alter their consciousness and also the experiences that they may have while using that particular substance. Now the second category here is alcohol, which is really a type of drug in itself. Uh, both alcohol and drugs induce a state of being called intoxication. So intoxication is just simply going to be a mentally altered state.
And really it's that mentally altered state that the individual is trying to achieve. And a lot of times that mentally altered state, the feeling of euphoria or the feeling of being really relaxed, whatever that intoxicated state is, is how both drugs and alcohol can lead towards addiction. And that addiction to drugs and alcohol frequently can lead to drug abuse. So first an individual begins to have compulsory behavior, begins to um, have the loss of control, and they begin to develop an addiction or an addictive behavior. And soon that prolonged addiction leads towards drug abuse, which is sort of the next step up from, from addiction. And drug abuse is going to be a maladaptive pattern of use. This male adaptive pattern of use is going to be persistent. The individual will begin to have disregard for negative consequences. can lead towards physical dependence. So it may present, drug abuse may present itself either with or without a physical dependence. Now, when drugs or alcohol do lead towards physical dependence. We have a cluster of physical symptoms that are presented. So persistent drug abuse causes this adaptation to the human body, to the human physiology, and it may lead to dependence. And this idea of, of drug dependence or alcohol dependence uh, this is, again, another cluster of symptoms. And dependence continues to occur. The, the requirement that the individual needs to continue to consume and procure their drug and alcohol of choice, this occurs despite problems that are associated with that abuse and that misuse of the substance. It continues to occur despite impairment. And it continues to occur despite physiological and psychological stress. So the symptoms are going to include seven different symptoms. And during the diagnosis process, an individual who presents three or more of these seven symptoms is considered to exhibit drug or alcohol dependence. So an individual who exhibits a high tolerance for the substance, which means they require a larger dose for a similar or the same effect. They would have one symptom for dependence. Uh, the individual who exhibits withdrawal symptoms and this is a physical and psychological response that is created with interrupted use. So 
physical and psychological symptoms that become apparent or that manifest. interrupted use. The third symptom is the requirement for large and prolonged dosing or an individual who exhibits large and prolonged dosing. So it may be a really large intake of a drug or alcohol or intake of the drug or alcohol for a prolonged period of time. The fourth symptom is constant expression. regulate your use, saying constantly that you need to regulate how much you're using, but you never really fully respond to that prompting. Symptom number five is a high use for procurement and or recovery time. So you spend a lot of time and energy to use and to get and to recover from your drug or alcohol use. The sixth symptom is giving up on important social or work related activities. And you're doing this so you can use. So you're choosing to use your drug or your alcohol of choice rather than engaging in these social or work activities. And then the last symptom is continued use of the drug despite symptom recognition. So you recognize that your drug use is problematic, yet you continue to utilize despite this recognition. All right, so let's look at some specific types of drugs and detail some of those so that we're aware of the vast variety of abusive substances that are out there. So this figure here shows a bunch of different types of drugs. And what you'll see is many of them come from uh, plants and other biological sources. They're going to include opioids, central nervous system depressants, central nervous system stimulants, which by the way also includes caffeine. And this class of drugs here includes the cannabinoids. Hallucinogenics, and inhalants. So the op opioids include uh, drugs like opium, uh, central nervous system depressants. Um, you can include Drugs like LSD, stimulants, things like ca uh, caffeine, cannabinoids, uh, include marijuana, hallucinogenics, things like acid, inhalants, um, things like cocaine. So each of these uh, present a variety of different physiological responses, but each of them can become uh, addictive substances. And who knows when that addiction is going to occur. It could be after just a single use or it could be after multiple uses. And really we don't know until someone engages in use of these drugs. So the big question becomes, how do we avoid misuse and overuse of drugs? So what are some of the steps that we can take 
to prevent drug abuse and misuse. And the key here is really to avoid use altogether. And the best ways to avoid use, we know that individuals are less likely to engage in drug use and alcohol use if they exhibit high self-esteem, if they exhibit a high academic success, physically active, and are well-educated on drug use. So prevention, and the key here is to avoid use and you can do this by increasing your self-esteem, by achieving success in academics, by incorporating daily physical activity, and to include educational material within your learning process to avoid drug misuse and abuse. I want to talk briefly about alcohol use. We're also going to talk a little bit about uh, tobacco use, and really we're going to take a look at these two because these are the two uh, most common or most prevalent forms of drug abuse and misuse in college age students and really across um, our culture today. Alcohol in particular is a widely acceptable form of drug abuse. despite being extremely dangerous and violent. So alcohol is widely accepted, yet it's an extremely dangerous and violent drug. So here are some statistics that show um, alcohol drinking status of Americans. So here in the United States, differentiated between male and female, men and women. And you'll notice that individuals who are lifetime abstainers, they don't consume alcohol. Um, about 30% of women and only 17.5% of men. Individuals who are former drinkers, about 14.9-15% of men and about 14% of women have been former drinkers and they've now stop drinking alcohol. Current drinkers though, and this is where we can get this notion that the use of alcohol is widely acceptable. Almost 68% and 56% of males and females in the United States currently um, consume alcohol in some form. I also said that it's an extremely dangerous drug. And what you can see is uh, here in the leading causes of death, things like heart disease, cancer, stroke, uh, etc. Each one of these has a uh, relationship to other behaviors. Tobacco use, physical activity, and uh, really physical inactivity, and alcohol are the three leading causes of death in the United States. So tobacco, physical inactivity, alcohol consumption lead towards prevalence of diseases like heart disease, cancer, stroke, etc. So it's, it is an extremely dangerous drug as well. Uh, if you take a look at uh, the average college population, uh, and you consider, in this case, it's five different individuals, uh, what you'll see is the amount of alcohol consumed on a typical American campus. Uh, the amount of alcohol in two beers is typically thought of as being shared between three students on average. One of those students will consume enough alcohol um, from a six-pack of beer uh, to, to equate to, to four, uh, four beers. And then a student, um, uh, the last student here, one student in that population, so one out of five, about 20% of students are going to be in a, um, a state of abstinence or, of, I guess I should say, um, abstaining from alcohol consumption. 
So 80% of college-age students are consumers of alcohol, 20% are excessive consumers of alcohol, and 20% are lifetime abstainers of alcohol use. It is also a violent drug. What this figure shows here in relation to the blood alcohol content of an individual, the number of drinks that they've consumed to achieve those blood alcohol levels, you can see the relative risk for uh, an automobile crash, which is a very violent incident, increases steadily. Once you get up to about two beers, you see that there's this exponential growth with three and above, where you are increasing your risk for a, a car accident with very small changes in blood alcohol concentration by 10, 20, 30, 45%. So by the time you've had four beers, double uh, of what we've had down here, four alcoholic um, drinks, four beers or four uh, glasses of wine, you're up over 45% risk for creating uh, or causing an automobile crash. So it's a very widely acceptable, but extremely dangerous and violent drug. Alcohol, um, the, the material or the substance that intoxicates an individual, which we would call the intoxicant, is going to be ethyl alcohol. Ethyl alcohol is a metabolic byproduct of a biological process called fermentation. Fermentation leads towards the production of ethyl alcohol. When an individual consumes ethyl alcohol, this builds up in the blood. It accounts for the blood alcohol concentrations that you see here. Uh, it is metabolized or removed from the individual's bloodstream by the liver. However, the liver is pretty inefficient at removing this metabolite, so it takes a prolonged period of time. Um, what you can see here are examples of what is um, going to be 0.6 ounces of alcohol contained in each of these um, different containers of drinks. So 16 ounces of beer. 12 ounces of beer, rather, will take, contain the 0.6 ounces of alcohol, that ethyl alcohol, or the intoxicant. Five ounces of wine contains that same amount of the intoxicant, and then 1.5 ounces of a hard liquor will contain that same uh, amount of ethyl alcohol. And so it needs to be metabolized by the liver, but like I've already mentioned, the liver really is not that great of, uh, of an organ, uh, and it's an inefficient metabolizer of alcohol, so it remains in the bloodstream for a prolonged period of time. And as long as alcohol is in the bloodstream, it does have physiological effects. And those physiological effects are going to include increasing the blood alcohol content. What we would measure as a blood alcohol concentration or a BAC. This is what is typically measured if you ever get into trouble with alcohol use uh, by a police station or a medical examiner. And it just simply equates to the amount of alcohol that is in the blood. It's a weight of alcohol per volume of blood measurement. And as long as it's in the blood, it has the ability to have a physiological effect. And so if we look at point 0.3 ounces of alcohol, so if we look at point 0.3 ounces of alcohol, which is about half the typical alcohol, um, or half the alcohol in a typical drink. So six ounces of beer, 2.5 ounces of wine, or uh, 0.7 ounces of hard liquor will have 0.3 ounces of alcohol. That 0.3 ounces of alcohol will be metabolized by the liver 
per time, uh, per hour, uh, per unit of time. So to metabolize all of the alcohol from the beer, it's going to take about two hours. Alcohol at low doses decreases inhibition. So it ends up decreasing your inhibition. You are more likely to do or to try something that you normally would not try if you had not consumed alcohol. At higher doses, there are many physical and many psychological effects. High doses of alcohol will lead towards a reduction in life expectancy. Leads towards an increase risk back, uh, for an increase in risk for many different chronic diseases. This includes heart attack, cancer, and cirrhosis, which is damage to the liver. It also increases the uh, rate in which we remove water from the bloodstream, so it causes excessive dehydration. It begins to pl pull fluid out of the cerebral spinal cavity, which is what surrounds the spinal cord and the brain. The brain literally becomes less buoyant, begins to sit harder on the spinal cord, which leads towards what people would call the hangover. Uh, so it's the brain pressing down on the spinal cord in particular, uh, it's pressing down on the brain stem and tissues like the medulla oblongata. It increases the likelihood of you uh, becoming increasingly violent. It increases the likelihood of use of other substances and drugs. So all types of different physiological and psychological factors. This is a picture that shows some of the immediate effects and some of the chronic effects from use uh, or prolonged use on a variety of different tissues and organ systems. Uh, I'll give you the opportunity to look over that on your own. So really the big take home message here from this summary of alcohol is alcohol is not worth any of the risk. There are very few benefits to alcohol. I mean, in fact, there are no real benefits to alcohol. They can't be achieved through other substances. Some people would say a glass of wine with dinner helps out with your, um, your heart health. You can actually gain the same uh, chemical. It's called reversitrol, and you can gain that from grape juice. So if you want to have the beneficial effects that come with drinking wine, consume a cup to a cup and a half of grape juice instead of the wine. The other substance that's highly used by college students is tobacco. And that tobacco comes in a variety of different forms from cigarette and cigar smoke to chewing tobacco. And fortunately, tobacco use is becoming less acceptable. But even the rate of tobacco use remains problematic because it's a very dangerous and very expensive drug. And it's not just expensive for the individual consuming it, it becomes very expensive for the population as a whole. Because health problems will quickly ensue after the use of smoking. So you can see here, this is the economic cost to our country, to the nation, that we attribute annually to smoking. And you can see that um, there's a total cost that is in the hundreds of billions, 157, almost $158 billion every year due to smoking. The intoxicant in cigarette smoke or in tobacco 
Browns nicotine. Which interacts with the central nervous system to stimulate the central nervous system through the nicotinic receptors. Um, it can cause jitteriness in the muscles because the muscles have a receptor that interacts with nicotine. So the intoxicant here is going to be nicotine. Let's talk a little bit about the effects of smoking. Individuals who smoke have between a 13.2 and 14.5 year reduction in their life expectancy. So 13.2 to 14.5 year reduction in life expectancy. So that's the difference between living basically almost into your 80s and passing away shortly after retirement at 65 years old. The use of nicotine interacting with the central nervous system in many of the tissues that it interacts with, nicotine causes and stu or stimulates dopamine to be released. stimulates dopamine release, and it's this dopamine release, dopamine release that leads towards a sense of euphoria. It's a pleasurable sense that allows the individual to have a much better outlook on a situation. Smoking does affect many other physiological systems. There are some very profound immediate effects, and again, I'll let you go ahead and take a look at those immediate effects. Feel free to look through them. Um, I'm going to lead towards damage of the lung tissue. And if we take a look at the lung, you can see that it increases mucus production. It decreases ciliary action, which is what clears um, those pollutants and toxins that actually make their way into the lungs as you breathe and allows the bronchioles to begin to occlude, reducing your ability to move air in and out of the lungs. The use of smoking also affects other people pretty heavily. Uh, even non-smokers are affected by smoking. Other people. This secondary effect it's called environmental tobacco smoke. That environmental tobacco smoke, also sometimes referred to as secondhand smoke. And there are two types of secondhand smoke. Mainstream, which is the smoke that's exhale, exhaled by the individual smoking and has been shown to have many of the same capabilities uh, as that first-hand smoke that the individual inhales themselves. The second type of uh, second-hand smoke is called side stream. And this is the smoke that comes off the burning end of the, the cigarette, the pipe, or, or the cigar.
Now, obviously, both of these types of secondhand smoke, mainstream and sidestream, you have to be exposed to while the individual's smoking. But we actually now recognize that there's a, another type of environmental tobacco smoke that's called third hand. And third hand smoke, or third hand environmental tobacco smoke, is actually going to come from the toxins and the chemicals that are released from clothing or drapery or rugs after a smoker has smoked a cigarette. So the clothing will absorb those toxins and chemicals. Uh, the toxins and chemicals are built up other surfaces. So you could walk into a hotel room that someone smoked in um, even perhaps months or a year, year or more ago, and those toxins are built up and are slowly being released and you're being exposed to them. And that third-hand smoke actually does have, um, uh, is related to, I should say, increased risk for certain types of diseases in particular cancer. So just like with alcohol, as we close down this lecture on alcohol uh, and drug abuse, misuse, and, and uh, misuse of substances, we can also conclude that smoking is not worth the money or the risk.